Lays it up for Freeman, and it's incomplete. Or did he, can he make the catch at the 15? Yes. What are they going to rule? That he caught it? Touchdown! Third down. Frost to the middle. Juggle! Diving touchdown, Nebraska! Mike Smith, so he's going to be the benefactor. But watch this shot from Eric Riva. It goes off right through the skate of Mark Giordano. You don't see that too often. The break drop is for Hansen. Yeah! Hansen! Something to bounce out. Oh, and he made it! The third time! Watch the ball leave the bat of Hunter Pence. It just shattered his bat. Had that spin on it that completely... It's going to get there. He turned 32 yesterday. Does he have a vintage moment in it? In the end zone, it is caught for the win! For the win, right? <laughs> hey, love all those plays. Everybody still jacked up about yesterday's game for that big win where the Cats take down Oklahoma. And I am so thankful Lene put a clip for Nebraska up there because we lost yesterday and I'm still kind of having a hard time recovering from that. But welcome everybody. We're glad you're here. And on behalf of our church, for our guests that are here for the first time, it's important to take just a second to say thank you for being with us. But a couple things I want to cover. First, my name is Brian. I'm our lead pastor. Second, when you walk through the door, you got a worship guide. I hope you grabbed one of these coming through the door. It's kind of all the stuff that's going on here. On the back are these sermons notes that you'll see up overhead as we get started but most importantly too is this connect with us card if you would fill that out with just like an email address drop it in the offering basket or drop it off at our welcome center at the end of the service we really love uh, the pastors we love connecting with you and just see if we can answer any questions you might have but we're really glad you're here yeah all those videos are exciting because every one of them was going for the win, and that has been the topic of this whole sermon series, is how do we go for the win? And you know, how many of you are still celebrating like yesterday's big win? Are you still there? Because that's like a top 10 win, right? Two, whatever. It's like we're all still kind of excited about that. And so, but I want to remind you tonight, we're actually celebrating here. We're celebrating the end of this series, this sermon series with a movie tonight. We'll tell you more about that at the end of the sermon. But we are in the last sermon of the series called For the Win. Uh, this is a fourth and final sermon, and this one's called Victory Over Sin. So if you missed any of the last three weeks, let me take a minute to recap this sermon series just so you can kind of know where we're at and what we're talking about. Week one, we're talking about victory over sin and winning in life. Week one, we talked about the playing field. We need to know, in any sport, you need to understand the playing field, the parameters, the inlines, the goal lines, the rules. And we talked about in our Christianity, the playing field is actually between two trees. The tree in the Garden of Eden in the very first book of the Bible where sin first was introduced into our lives, which completely changed the playing field, to the last tree of the Bible in the book of Revelation, the tree of life, where sin is actually vanquished forever. And we play between, in our Christian lives, between those two trees in our lives. And so that was week one, setting up the playing field. Week two was talking about our opponent and his playbook. And so I want to show you a graphic up here. I want to re-summarize. He has a playbook with six plays. The opponent, the enemy, wants us to lose. But ladies and gentlemen, let me make you understand, it's more than lose. He wants our destruction. And so he goes with six plays, kind of starting from the bottom to the top as he moves towards his goal. The first is, is that the opponent gets us to believe a lie. The opponent wants to disrupt our lives with sin, so he gets us to believe a lie. We believe that lie, which introduces a sin into our life. And the second play he throws at us is that he gets fear. He loves to encapsulate when we sin, he's our accuser. So he wraps that in fear. And then the third play he throws at us is he gets us to take a vow. I will always, I will never, these vows that we take to protect the fear and the lie and the sin that we have in our life. And when those three, three things mount up, we get a mindset. And the mindset is where we rationalize and justify all this sinful behavior in our lives. It's another layer of protection over that. And once we have a mindset like that, we introduce the next play that the enemy throws at us, which is called surrender, I'm sorry, resistance to the truth. When we have those four layers built up and we create a mindset, the very thing that can save us, we become resistance to. 
And on the final play that the enemy throws at us is what we call habits of the flesh. These are the things like drug addiction, alcohol, entertainment, gluttony, anger, isolation. He wraps it all with these six layers as he builds this stronghold of addiction in our lives through sin. This is how the enemy comes to destroy us. And we spend a lot of time working on that outer layer instead of working on the lie. And we need to work on the root issue of the lie. But that was two weeks ago. Then we came back next week. Well, that's the opponent's playbook. Now let's show you Jesus' playbook. This is his playbook that counters. It's moving in the other direction towards his goal. The first thing he counters a lie with is the what? Truth. He shares the truth with us, which counters a lie, which then becomes faith. Faith is the opposite of fear. Faith is believing in God's goodness and his truth will always be there for me no matter what I see or what I'm going through life. And so once we have truth and we have faith, instead of vow, we have humility. A vow is a personally saying, I can take care of this, I will do it. Humility says, I'm reliant on God and I'm reliant on the church to walk with me through life and to help deal with these issues with sin. And once we have truth, faith, and humility, we don't have a mindset, we actually have the mind of Christ. Those are all the characteristics that define him. And once we have that mind of Christ, then we have surrender to the truth. Now truth, I trust in God's truth all the time through his word. I'm surrendered to it. I'm surrendered to him. I allow him to fill me up. And when you add all that up, instead of habits of the flesh, you get fruit of the spirit. Joy, peace, love, all the good things. And so that's Jesus' playbook, the six plays he puts in our lives to counter what the enemy's trying to do. So we have a playing field. We have both playbooks. We know how this game goes on. So the final thing we got to ask about is what? Who wins, right? How do we win in this game of life? We all want to win. For the Christian, the most important thing in our life is that we win the day we die, that we have victory over death. And so this week we're focused on that final victory. How do we defeat sin and the power of sin? And so here's a spoiler alert. You ready for a spoiler alert? Ruins the whole sermon right now. Here it is. As Christians, we're on the winning team. We already win. What does that mean? Well, we're going to talk about that. So today we're going to talk about how we can claim victory over sin. This is the last sermon. We know everything now. How do we really have victory? So I like winning. As you guys know, I'm a competitive guy. I love basketball. Um, But I know my mental and physical limitations today that sometimes put me on the losing side. When I play basketball today, my mind is still 19 years old. My body is 53. And so normally I don't recognize the guy blown by me uh, until about two hours ago. But I still love playing by 10. But losing is something that is real. I don't have the ability, the physical and mental ability to always be on the winning side. So when I think about winning in basketball, it's like if I could just do this, if I could just have Michael Jordan inside of me, (laughs) I can win every time, right? Michael Jordan is the GOAT, right? The greatest of all time in basketball, amen? Amen. Ooh, I got a few. I was a little hesitant first service. In the 80s and 90s, he was one of the best players in basketball. If I could be like Mike, if I could put Michael in me, I could always win. If I could be like Mike. Remember, that was one of the most famous Gatorade commercials. Watch this. We got a little clip of it. If I could be like Mike. Sometimes I dream that he is me. You got to see that's how I dream to be. I dream I move, I move, I dream I groove like Mike. If I could be like Mike, oh, if I could be like Mike, like Mike. If I could be like and Mike, be like Mike, be like Mike, oh. be like Mike. <laughs> Sometimes I dream that he is me. You've got to see that's how I dream to be. I dream I move. I dream I groove like Mike. If I could be like Mike. If I could be like Mike, I'm sure I could have the victory. His power moves, his long-range shot, his first powerful quick step. When it comes to winning, I think we all want to be like our heroes. If we could just channel our heroes of our life into us, we could win more. Maybe your hero is Steph Curry. Maybe it's LeBron James, James Harden. 
Maybe it's Serena Williams in tennis. Maybe it's Mia Hamm. Maybe it's Jackie Joyner Kersey in track, for those of you who go back a little ways. Maybe it's Bill Gates in your success in work. Maybe it's Steve Jobs. Maybe it's Indra Nui, who's a tremendous woman and CEO of Pepsi. But I will tell you, of all of our heroes, one thing every hero that I just listed out will tell you is how many times they've what? Failed. How many times they've failed that they didn't have the power to win? Michael will tell you how many shots he missed to win the game is more than the ones he hit to win the game. Bill Gates will tell you how many projects that have failed. And Mia Hamm, this is a quote, she says, I fail every time in practice. So being like our heroes, all that ensures is that we will still fail at victory at life. So here's our first sermon note together. Our power for victory will fall short. Our ability to win over sin, our ability to win over life will fall short. Being a Christian, failure is certain on our part. To win at life, to have victory in the end, on that final day, ladies and gentlemen, we can't on our own. We don't have that kind of power. None of us do. Maybe we'll get some victories on the way based on our abilities and our talents and our skills, yes, but not for the final championship of life and taking on the power of sin. We do not have that power. But what if, what if I told you you could have that power? What if I told you you could have that power today? And what if I told you you can have assurance, 100% ironclad guarantee that you will have victory over life in the final championship game or at death's door that you can win without hesitation? We'd all like that, wouldn't we? Well, that's our second sermon note there. Many Christians do not know the potential that's in them. Many of us do not know or understand the potential to win that is in us. Many Christians want to believe, but come up short believing of this potential that lives in them. Jesus, when he was with his disciples in the last days, he was talking to them for three years they've been together, and he says, hey, I am going away. Actually, he introduced that he is going to die. And you can imagine the 12 guys who invested the last three years of their life walking with him were concerned, troubled, distraught. Because Jesus was their Michael Jordan. He was their victory. And what did he just tell them? And Jesus looks at me and he says, hey, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. Jesus says, you will have the victory and then later when Jesus reappeared to them in the 40 days after he was resurrected, he told them this, and it's out of Luke 24, 49. He told them about a new potential that they have in them. Luke 24, 49, the scripture reads, this is Jesus talking to his guys. He says, and now I will send the Holy Spirit. Just as my father had promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you. NIV says, close you with power from heaven. Jesus told me, he says, the Holy Spirit will come and he will bring you power from heaven. He will fill you with his presence and his power and this is just as God had promised. And we might look at that and say, well, that's really cool. He promised, Jesus told his 12 that, but what about us? What about us, Christ followers in this room? Well, he went over that in John 7, verses 37 through 38. Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Into verse 39, it says, and when he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone who believes in him. That's us, gang. 
everyone who believes in Jesus is promised the gift of the Spirit. As a matter of fact, the day you believed, he came into your life. For everyone who believes, we can be filled with the Spirit. We can have a new potential, a power to win over sin. And a lot of times we're like, yeah, I know there's that gift of the Holy Spirit, but do we really believe in his presence and his power? The Holy Spirit is often incorrectly thought of by humans and, and by Christians. Sorry, that's probably a better description of that. The, is that. And I think of this, it reminds me the Star Wars teaser came out for around Christmas, right? The next Star Wars movie is coming out. And I think a lot of times we think the Holy Spirit is like Star Wars. It's a force. The Holy Spirit is a force. It's something we tap into. It's something that's given to us. It's an it. It's a mystic gas. It's, it's all these weird things that sometimes it's external of us. That is not how the Bible describes the Holy Spirit. Can I give you, I want to give you just all the descriptions of the Holy Spirit in the Bible, right? All of them. Listen to this. These are right from God's word. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jehovah. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the living God. He is the Spirit of Jesus. He is the Spirit of promise. He is the Spirit of of holiness. He is a spirit of judgment. He is a spirit of burning. He is a spirit of truth. He is a spirit of wisdom and understanding. He is a spirit of counsel and might. He is a spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. He is a spirit of life. He is the oil of gladness. He is the spirit of grace. He is the spirit of grace and supplication. He is the spirit of glory. He is the eternal spirit. He is the comforter and he is the advocate all the ways the Bible describes the Spirit. And ladies and gentlemen, when you look at that list, the Holy Spirit has the power for everything we need to win in life. Everything. But ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity who lives in us. A lot of people struggle with the Holy Spirit and who he is and what he does in their life. And this is really important we catch for this next part. To live in us, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. He's a gift given to us to dwell in us requires a relationship with him. A daily interaction. He's here. You can talk to him. He's around you. He's in you. You can surrender to him. You can give up all these places in my spiritual life and let him flood those areas and let him truly fill you. You can talk to him. We call it prayer. You talk to him all day long. He's right there. The presence of God and Jesus in us through the Spirit. And we can listen to his voice. That is where relationship comes from. We can listen to him. We say, ah, Brian, don't do that. And Brian, come with me. Let's do this. We can listen to that voice all the time. Knowing he's here, knowing we're in relationship with him. So here's our next note together. So victory over sin is found not just in imitation, but in inhabitation. Fun big words to say, right? Not just in imitation. So once we understand the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we naturally want to connect with him. We naturally want to be like him. And so imitation is good. It's good to want to be like the Holy Spirit. But it's more important to understand this fact. This is where people miss out on the power and presence of the Holy Spirit is that to live in the power of the Spirit, we need to understand in habitation, Him living in us. The power comes from the fact that He lives in us, we're responsive to Him, and ladies and gentlemen, He is a permanent residence in us. It's a permanent resident. When it comes to victory over sin, the Holy Spirit inhabits us and he works four specific ways in our lives in just dealing with victory over sin. So I want to go over these four ways that his inhabitation, the way he inhabits us, lives in us, the four specific ways that helps us overcome sin. Okay, the first is that he convinces us of our sin. 
He convinces us. The word is convict, but the word is convinced. It's much bigger here. John 16, 15 through 11, or 5 through 11. I encourage you to go check these scripture verses. It's why we got them there for you during the week and go back into the word because I'm only hitting on part of it. But John 16, 5 says, and when he comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of its sin. He will convict the world of God's righteousness and he'll convict us of the coming judgment. So those three things means that he will convict us of our sin. He'll not only tell us the guilt that we have of that and help us get through that, but he'll convince us not to go back there. The second thing he, convict, he convicts us of is the righteousness of God. He convinces us through the action of Jesus on the cross that we have been made right with God. And the third way is that he convinces us of judgment, not ours. He convinces us the judgment of the enemy. When Jesus died on a cross, we mostly look at that and say Jesus was judged on the cross. No, 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 the enemy was judged on the cross. The enemy was judged on the cross. The Holy Spirit convinces us that the enemy is a condemned criminal. He has already lost He's just trying to hang on for everything he's got, but he knows what the end will be. So he's been judged so we can be victorious. So that's the first way he convinces us. The second way when the Holy Spirit inhabits us is that once we're convicted of sin and once we know about it and how to avoid it and the power of it, he sets us free from it. It is the Holy Spirit that sets us free from our sin. This is in Romans 8, 2. And because you belong to him, talking about Jesus, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The Holy Spirit is the one who frees us from the power of sin and death. There is no condemnation for those who believe in Jesus. He sets us free once and for all from the power of sin and its natural consequence, which is death. Our freedom is not based on what we do, but who is in us. And this power we get from the Holy Spirit is not a freedom from, but a freedom to live in the fullness of life that Jesus came and died for. So not only does he, and when, he, when the Holy Spirit inhabits us, not only does he convince us of our sin and then sets us free from that, but that sets the stage to the next thing where he can make us new. Not only have we been aware of the sin and set free from it, but now we're at the stage where he can make us new. And John 3, verses 3 through 6, this is what the scripture reads. It says, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, Jesus says, gives birth to spiritual life. Gives birth means new. We are made new in our lives by the Holy Spirit. He does it. This is the power that's in us. We are regenerated is a term that we often use. From the realm of fallen man to the realm of God. By his spirit. And by his power. You know what makes us children of God? It is not that we had good parents. and It's not because of things we do. It is because of God's spirit. That we are made children of God. So not only does he convince us that sin, not only does he free us and then make us new, but that sets the stage for this important work of the Holy Spirit when he inhabits us as he forms Christ in us. It's beautiful. It just progresses here. Ephesians 3, 16 through 17, it says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources he will empower you with the inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. This power we get from the Holy Spirit gives us a new inner strength. God's salvation and empowerment for us makes us worthy vessels for Jesus to dwell in us. 
To be a Christian is to be like Christ. To be holy is to be more Christ-like. That's the old word sanctification, is become more like Christ every day. Who does that work? The Holy Spirit does that work in us every day, making us more like Christ. He shows us Christ. He makes us like Christ. He reveals Christ. His truth, his humility, his grace, his love changes us to the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Be like Mike? No, I say be like Jesus. <laughs> because he never fails. And so look at this list. And to me, it's just absolutely amazing. The Holy Spirit does so much more in our lives than this. But this is how he gives us victory over sin. We don't have to be worried about our power when we have power like this. Sin is our obstacle to victory, but God has assured through Jesus the dwelling of his spirit to give us power to completely defeat the power of sin and make sure we're all, everybody in this room can be victorious on that championship game day. N.T. Wright, he, he's a pastor and a great writer. He says, those in whom the spirit comes to live are God's new temple. God does not dwell in buildings. He now dwells in us through his spirit. They are individually and corporately places where heaven and earth meet. Because the Holy Spirit in us, we are a place where heaven and earth meet. And not only is this cool about what the Holy Spirit does for every person in this room who believes and who understands that inhabitation and dwells and, and is in relationship with him, but ladies and gentlemen, look at how many of us are in a room and look what the Holy Spirit does for the church. This is the power of his people in community is us all together with that same power. You've now magnified it by 400 today. So our last sermon note together is, um, this is that spoiler alert. For those who believe in Jesus, we have already won. <laughs> We've already won. And some of us fail to grasp this. We live life like we're still defeated. When you get knocked down, get up, because you don't have to live life defeated. You have already won, Christ follower. Live your life like the championship game is coming. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate that. You guys, we have to live our life like we know. This last day on this earth is our championship game, and we've already won. The reason that we have won is because of Jesus, because of his victory on the cross. Now we can have victory. Ushers, would you come forward for communion? Communion is a time where we remember the victory on the cross, and we celebrate that we can have victory too. For our guests, if you're a Christ follower, please join us. The table is open to all who believe. As these come around, I'd ask that you take a cup and a piece of bread and just hold it for a little while. We're going to take it together here in a little bit. Go ahead, gentlemen. And when we're done, just set the cup on the floor. But for this time, I want to remind us of the Apostle Paul and what he told us about preparing our hearts. Take this time while the music's playing to examine our hearts, to do a heart check here. Take this time to remove any distractions because this is a really important victory that we're celebrating. Take this time to ask forgiveness and clean your slate with God. Take this time to remember that we're all coming together in community. We're doing this not as individuals. We're doing this as a church. So take and hold, and we'll take them together in just a moment. I'll read from you uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took some bread. 
and he gave thanks to God for it. And they broke it into pieces and he gave it to his closest friends that around the table with him. He said, guys, this is my body, which is given for you. He asked them whenever they take it to, to, when they, to always remember him and about what he's about ready to do on the cross and his resurrection. This bread symbolizes the amazing grace and the sacrifice of Jesus' body given for us. On the cross, Jesus' sacrifice brought God's judgment onto our enemy. The enemy is now defeated. Jesus now has the victory. So let's take remembering that sacrifice together. Continuing on the scripture, it says in the same way that Jesus took a cup of wine after supper, he said, this cup is a new agreement between God and his people. An agreement, Jesus said, that's confirmed with my blood, which is what this symbolizes. He asked that we do this in remembrance of him as often as we drink from it. For every time Jesus said, you eat this bread and you drink this cup, Every time you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. This cup symbolizes Jesus' blood poured out for us, another amazing act of grace. By his blood, we are washed clean. By the Spirit, we are forgiven and we are set free. More importantly is now we can share in his victory. Let's take it together. I'd like to share a scripture with you that I want us all to read together. It's back out of Ephesians 3. And I want us to read this together because this summarizes everything in this sermon series and it summarizes today and it summarizes communion. Would you read this with me? It says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with the inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand as all God's people should how wide how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Say amen one more time. Amen. amen. Ushers, would you come back forward and let's pray for the offering together. Would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your son who claimed victory on that cross, but he did not leave us. He sent the Spirit. Father, we never want to rush through offering. It is a time that we give back to you. And so this is a thing we want to give today, that we know that Spirit in us, who dwells in us. We talk to him. We know him every day. We listen to him. We let him fill the places of our life that so badly need filling that light needs to pour into. That's our offering, that we can live victoriously. Father, when the tough days come ahead, it doesn't matter. We know we don't lose. We always have hope because of what Jesus did and the power of the Spirit in us. Thank you, God. And our offering is our lives back to you, everything we've got to live 
life in that power. Father, I pray for true church today over in St. George. Father, they are looking at Pastor Art, our guy, as their lead pastor, and they're voting on that today. Father, our hands are always open with our people here, that however you use them in the kingdom, that we're open-handed with them. And if this is your will, then we're excited that Pastor Art and his family will be there and take truth to the next season of their lives and grow them as a church. So Father, I just ask your blessing on that church today. I ask a blessing that the vote affirms, Father, how you are at work through your spirit. Father, pray for our church this week. We have a lot of opportunities to reach our community starting tonight and Thursday night, but all of us carry that spirit and power in us. It is not for us alone. It is for a world that lives in darkness and does not know Jesus. So, Father, empower all of us in the spirit this week to live life to the full. Avoid the enemy's playbook. Live by Jesus' playbook for the win. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I got this feeling inside my bones. It goes electric, wavy when I turn it on. All through my city, all through my home. We're flying up, no ceiling when we in our zone. I got that sunshine in my pocket. Got that good soul in my feet. I feel that hot blood in my body when it drops. Ooh, I can't take my eyes off of it. Moving so phenomenally. You're more like the way we rock it. So don't stop. So let me go through just a couple announcements. That first movie video clip, uh, when the game stands tall, we're playing that tonight here. It's a, it's a family-oriented movie. It kind of summarizes this whole sermon series really well, but that movie's here tonight at 6. Please come. Please bring somebody with you. Invite somebody that could really be inspired by that message. Uh, that way we're reaching our community all the time, but we'll take care of you once you're here. Another way are that we're reaching out um, is that Trunk or Treat is this Thursday night. Uh, we encourage you to come no matter what the weather might do. We encourage you to come. We'll have a battle plan that whole night, but it's one of our biggest events of the year where the community connects with our church. We have opportunity to talk to people, especially in our neighborhood here. And so if come to that, bring your kids to that, volunteer for that. We would love to have you involved with that. That's coming up on Thursday night. To our guests, we're really thankful you're here. Um, you can fill out this card, but we actually do meet and greet tonight. I almost forgot this. So right after this service, right here in the front of the church, just if you've been coming to Westview for a short amount of time, would you come hang out with myself and a couple other ministry leaders? We'd like to get to know you. So we can meet right here at the front at the end of the service. You can give us that connect card, but we are really glad you're here. Uh, young adults, there is a food fellowship right after this, right through those doors. So young adults, uh, hang out here and come meet with us right afterwards. And the last thing I have to mention is that before we leave, this is why I want to do meet and greet here, is we need to actually tear down this section of chairs, this section of chairs on the far sides, not the middle ones, the far sides in the back row and stack them. Could a few of you help us stack those really quick before we leave tonight? That would be a big help for us. So would you please stand with me? I am thankful you're all here. I'm thankful that now we're all charged up to go out and be Christ to the world. Amen. So I want to leave you again. I want to go back over verse 20 of Ephesians 3 as our sending call. It says, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. <laughs> glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. And all the people yelled, Amen. Amen. Have a great week. See you tonight. See you Thursday night. See you at lunch. 
Have a great week.